Good morning, uh, everyone. Great to be here, uh, and a uh, particular pleasure for me to introduce a longtime friend and colleague, yes, Dr. Thomas Harnish, who serves as the Vice President for Government Relations for SHEO, the State Higher Education Executive Officers Association. Uh, for decades, they've been based in Boulder, Colorado, but they uh, launched a uh, federal relations uh, outfit uh, that Tom started three years ago, and he has a very broad uh, portfolio, obviously federal policy, also tracking state policy, advocacy, communications, you name it. Um, from 2007 to 2019, he served as the Director of State Policy, State Relations, uh, for ASCU, the American Association of State Colleges and Universities. It was my pleasure to hire him from MEC in 2007, where he was a graduate assistant. And uh, uh, at the time, ASCU was the only uh, big six pres high red presidential group in DC that had a state policy shop. So for eight years, it was the Dan and Tom show. Uh, represented over 400 and some public universities, put together a national conference. Uh, put together a very broad uh, higher ed public policy agenda focused on federal and state policy and uh, really enjoyed uh, working with him during that time. He is a Midwestern native uh, out of Wisconsin, undergrad at UW-Madison, uh, a master's at University of Minnesota, doctorate at George Washington University, still serves uh, year-round as a, or I say on occasion, uh, as an adjunct at both George Washington University in Georgetown. Uh, he is probably one of those widely quoted uh, individuals in the American higher ed press. Um, very dedicated, eats, sleeps, higher ed policy, not so sure about the sleeps part. Um, uh, for those of you who do not receive his daily email, I do, don't think, I'm being serious about this, that there is a publication in this country that has more substance that comes in today at 645 uh, a minute later uh, than yesterday, so you're slipping a little bit. Uh, but uh, every day around 8 o'clock or so, he sends out what has happened in higher ed policy in the last 24 hours. Federal policy, national reports, state policy headlines, etc. So uh, I encourage you to sign up to receive that, and then he also puts out a federal update uh, every Tuesday. Uh, so, uh, glad he's here. Uh, he is the definition of uh, Midwestern nice, and we're just really happy to have you here. Coming up, Dr. Tom Harnish. Well, thank you, Dan, for that warm introduction. Um, Dan has been a mentor and friend for so many years, and he's really uh, helped me so much in my uh, career uh, in higher education. He mentioned the, my doctorate. Uh, he helped me uh, with my doctorate and in, in, in so many facets of of, uh, of my work portfolio. Uh, it's great to be back uh, here in St. Paul, Minnesota. Thank you, Mech, for the invitation. This is a bit of a homecoming for me. I, um, after Dan said I graduated from the University of Wisconsin, I moved up here uh, to St. Paul. And I lived with my cousin on uh, just a few blocks from here. So I tell people, yeah, I used to live in St. Paul. And they're like, OK. I used to live on West 7th Street. They're like, OK. I used to live next to Tom Reed's hockey pup. OK, now I know exactly where you were. Um, but uh, so I, I lived just a few blocks from here. And uh, in the fall of 2005, uh, and my cousin, with friends, we wanted to go to that hockey pub, but of course that requires some money. And uh, so I was looking for jobs, and I found this opportunity at the Midwestern Higher Education Compact. Uh, and I applied, and I got the job there, and, and worked two really happy years uh, at MEC. So they, they are just, abs between MEC and Dan, they've been absolutely instrumental uh, in my career in higher education. I just thank them so much for, for all the help that they've given me. So last night, we, I was listening to the presentation. It's a little depressing, a little depressing. Now we're going to listen to the federal update. <laughs> try, try explaining a, a laddered continuing resolution. That's depressing. Um, so we'll, we'll get into it. Um, we have plenty of time here uh, with 
um, our, our, our next speaker not being able to make it. So I welcome any questions or comments or insights um, that you can, um, uh, please feel free to speak up at any time. So let's dig into the, uh, the federal update. All right. So uh, we'll first talk with budget and appropriations. I turned on the news yesterday and had that ominous clock, you know. So many hours till shutdown and the clock keeps rolling and rolling. I'm like, oh boy. Um, so that, uh, we'll talk about budget and appropriations. Give the lay of the land on federal legislation, kind of where the, the various sides are on uh, federal higher education policy. Give a brief update on FAFSA simplification. We'll talk more about that uh, tomorrow, but I know that's incredibly important to, to your states. Uh, student loan repayment uh, is, of course, another issue uh, that the, the Biden administration has been very active on. Uh, the regional tech hubs, um, have you, any of you applied for those regional tech hubs or, okay, so one, two, okay. Uh, I'd be interested to, to hear more about your experiences with that. Uh, and the regulations, and of course this administration has been very active on the, on the regulatory front. So let's, uh, let's dig into this. Okay, budget and appropriations. So we were supposed to have a federal budget done on October 1. Uh, it is not October 1. We're past that deadline. So they passed a continuing resolution. Um, you remember the drama from a few weeks ago when that led to the House Speaker being ousted. And so that continuing resolution will keep the government funded until November 17th. So that is later this week. So what is the plan to keep the government funded? Well, uh, House Speaker uh, Mike Johnson ha in the House GOP conference, they have proposed a laddered continuing resolution, a laddered CR. Now, until a few days ago, I didn't know what a laddered CR was. <laughs> uh, I, was familiar with, I was familiar with CRs, but I was not familiar with the laddered CR. So what is the laddered CR? Um, it basically takes the 12 appropriation bills to fund the government and it breaks them into tranches. So this would have a two-tranched approach. Instead of doing all the bills together, um, they would uh, break them up. So they would have uh, one tranche, the first tranche um, would continue to fund the government. Again, this is not the regular process. This is just temporary patch funding to keep the government going at current levels. So it would have one tranche uh, that would be uh, continue until January 19th and then another tranche, which would be until February 2nd. So um, what, does, what does all this mean? Well, there was pushback from Republicans about um, the concern was what we've done in recent years is that we've passed these continuing resolutions to keep the government funded, and then right before the holidays, we would pass a big spending bill. And they were they're not particularly keen on, on doing that. They want to take it you know, one bill at a time and have more negotiations uh, on this. So this would actually punt it until uh, early January, or mid-January mid or February 2nd, and they can take it um, one bill uh, at a time. Uh, and the labor HHS education bill, which is generally the hardest bill, that's the bill that we, uh, our programs are in, that's generally the hardest bill to pass just because of politics related to health care and uh, abortion policy and the like, um, that, uh, that's, uh, that is in the second tranche. But uh, Democrats have responded. They're, they're not particularly keen on this. I know one of them called it a gimmick, uh, but they do want to see the government funded, and they want a clean CR, so they don't want uh, all sorts of policy riders attached to it. They just want to keep the government funded. And so it looks like something like this will likely pass sometime this week. Uh, it will pa pass likely with bipartisan support. I know the Fre House Freedom Caucus, which is a more conservative wing of, of the GOP caucus, has said that, they, uh, that, that they're not going to vote for this because they think spending level, to continue current spending levels because they think those spending levels are too high. So it's likely going to be a coalition of, of Democrats and Republicans trying to, to keep the government funded. Uh, at least until early next year. 
So that is where we are at on, a, uh, on budget and appropriations. So just continuing uh, a continuing resolution to keep government funded until early next year at current levels. Uh, but I'll get into, what I'll get into next is what the, um, uh, what the actual appropriations process looks like. So we had the, if you remember earlier this year, we had the debt ceiling negotiations. And what came out of the debt ceiling negotiations was more or less over the next two fiscal years, non-defense discretionary spending. So uh, that purple box right there, non-defense discretionary spending would be more or less held flat for the next two years. So flat this year, a 1% bump next year, but pretty much flat. So on the Senate side, what they've said is, okay, um, we're, they passed all of their appropriation bills out of committee, and they said, okay, we're just basically going to abide by this plan uh, that we have for the next two years, and funding for programs is, again, more or less flat. Uh, the House GOP, though, has countered and said, hey, we don't like uh, where we're going as far as uh, the national debt goes. You guys set a, we set a cap about spending, but we did not set a floor. So they have uh, pursued uh, some, some spending cuts uh, uh, on the non-defense discretionary side, including uh, those programs affecting higher education. So this is uh, a chart from the Committee for Education Funding uh, detailing uh, uh, FY24 education funding levels. Uh, they have the president's budget um, which would go up, I think it says 90 million right there, or 90 billion right there. Uh, and then they have the House uh, and the Senate. And as you can see, the Senate bill basically uh, keeps things constant while the House is, is pushing for some cuts. So how would this play out as far as our programs that we care about in higher education? The maximum Pell Grant funding. So the maximum Pell Grant right now is $7,395. Uh, the president's uh, proposed plan is, is out there at, at 82.15. The president's plan is, is sort of moot right now because of the, the debt ceiling deal. So I think the, the, the key, two key terms there are the, the Senate committee and where the House is at. And the Senate has said we're going to give Pell a $250 bump. And the House has come back and said we're going to keep funding for Pell flat. So... Um, that's what we're looking at for the, the Max Pell Grant. Uh, federal work study uh, under the Republican plan would be eliminated. Uh, and that's a program that's been around, of course, for, for decades. Uh, the FSEOG program, the Federal Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant program uh, for low-income students, that would also be uh, eliminated in the Republican plan. Uh, TRIO would be held flat. Uh, Gear Up would be held flat. Campus Child Care. Um, which uh, right now is at a $75 million program. Uh, that would be eliminated. Uh, graduate assistance would be eliminated. And then one program uh, that I want to draw your attention to is called Post-Secondary Student Success Grants. And this is a new program uh, that Shia was particularly high on. And it would give money um, to uh, campuses, systems, states, um, based on, to scale evidence-based best practices in higher education. It's known as PSSG. Uh, it does have bipartisan support, uh, although the, the budget would call for cutting it. But um, uh, there are so many uh, great practices out there that we really would like to, to invest in. I just got back um, from the uh, convening that we had in New York on the CUNY ASAP program. Is anyone familiar with that program? Okay. So that uh, provides wraparound services for students going to community college. So in New York, that would provide them with a subway card, um, help on books, block tutoring, uh, tutoring, block scheduling. Basically, if you look at all the barriers that students face going to a community college, it would go and try to address all of those. It doesn't come cheap, right? But the results are undeniable, doubling graduation rates. 
doubling graduation rates. And that was in New York City. They took it to Ohio, doubling the graduation rates. It works. It's randomized controlled study. So RCT, it's the gold standard of studies. That works. It does cost money, of course, to do. But when you actually factor in the fact that more students graduate, per graduate, it's actually less. So we, we've seen other you know, interventions like that that work, and we want to, uh, want to scale them. And so this is a program that, that SHEO is, is going to continue to, to fight for. Um, and ultimately, we want you know, a lot more money given to states. Uh, it's a competitive grant program uh, and given to states so they can scale uh, programs that work. Okay, any questions on the federal uh, budget at all? So, and the White House has basically said that if you try to pass this House budget with these cuts, we will veto it. So, there, it looks like there's going to have to be some sort of negotiation in, in 2024 about where we, where we meet on, on these programs. Yeah. Um, Tom, I have a question. This is Susan Hegard speaking. Um, where are, you talked a little bit about the House and kind of where the varying opinions are, but in the Senate, you know, where are Senate Republicans or most of the Senate right. Republicans versus the Senate Democrats? Yeah, so the Senate Republicans and Senate Democrats are actually, they passed uh, the, uh, the Appropriations Committee with bipartisan support. So the, the Senate numbers that you see there uh, have broad bipartisan support in the, in the Senate Appropriations Committee. They're basically saying, hey, we agreed to this debt ceiling deal earlier this year and we're just going to abide by it. Uh, but the House has been a little bit more aggressive in, in seeking to, to, to make budget cuts um, as they see uh, they have concerns about national debt. Yeah, oh, question? Yeah. Uh, Prana Fathari, Illinois. Um, on the House side, where do you see the most flexibility where we see a bunch of those dashes and the big cuts? Like if you were to project or forecast where you think there might be room uh, to bring those up? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think a lot of those programs really do have uh, broad support. So uh, I, I'm not exactly sure. I know, of course, the, the foundation there is Pell and that they do not, it, when you touch Pell Grants, it's, it's, it's politically very dicey. Um, but uh, I would say that uh, I think work study, just because it's uh, been around so long and there are many, many people who have benefited from work study, um, that program I think is, is, does have some uh, foundation of support. Uh, the other programs, I, I'm not, not as sure, but it will likely be somewhere probably closer to the Senate numbers than the House numbers, but uh, um, it, it might, the Senate numbers might come down a little bit just to accommodate the House. Yep. Yeah. Rachel Croson. It was collaboration with the Democrats on the budget that got McCarthy removed. Mm -hmm. And now I'm hearing that yeah. Johnson's going to need to collaborate with the Democrats in order to get this budget passed. Yeah. So we'll be looking at a new speaker. In well, I, I, I don't want to go there. <laughs> we, just, we just got done with that. Um, but I do know that, I mean, I think that there's going to be some grace for him, uh, for, at least for right now, to, to, to get a, a, a CR through. Um, but yeah, continued collaboration with Democrats. Uh, I think that House Freedom Caucus will let them only go so far on that. Uh, but I think for right now, they're, they're going to give them some grace. Morna. Morna Foy, Wisconsin. Um, hi, Tom. Thank hey. you for being here. Um, can you just talk a little bit more about the federal work study? Because I understand the zero out on all these other programs from that caucus, but federal work study is We've been getting so much pressure to provide more internship opportunities, yeah. more um, learn and earn at the same time. And you know, work study seems to be right up that alley. We're, we've been trying to do more of that. Yeah. It seems very odd that they would be, of all these programs, frankly, that's the one, they, one of the ones they would zero out. Yeah, and I've seen bipartisan support for a lot of these programs, like you've said. Federal work study, because it does have that work element into it, I, I've seen broad bipartisan support for it. Um, but I think that they're just coming down and they're, they're just looking for, for areas to cut or maybe even consolidate programs. Um, the post-secondary student success grants, I was meeting with Hill staff the other day, uh, Republican staff, and they're just like, yeah, we're very supportive of that program. Now, um, 
that might not be reflected in the budget, uh, but but they they said that their their chairman is 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 quite supportive of that program. So uh, I would just encourage you if if you support these programs um, to reach out to your delegation and let them know, uh, show them how these uh, programs are uh, are benefiting students. Okay. Okay. Other questions? Okay. All right. Proceed. Okay, let's talk about federal legislation. So where are we at? Um, this is, uh, I'm gonna go over to start with the Senate side. So this is the Senate, the, the leaders of the Senate Help Committee, Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions. Uh, the chair is uh, Bernie Sanders of Vermont. And the ranking member is uh, Bill Cassidy. He's a Republican of Louisiana. And it's interesting, I, I thought that the, the help committee with, um, with Senator Sanders would hold a lot more hearings on higher education. He's actually focused more on the, the labor uh, portion of his portfolio. Um, so I haven't seen a whole lot of movement, but he has introduced his uh, College for All Act, uh, which of course is a, a very aggressive plan uh, for free community college free public four-year college uh, for those under a certain threshold, uh, funding for HBCUs, HSIs, doubling Pell Grants, um, evidence-based best practices and strategies, TRIO and gear up. So uh, those are his, uh, his aspirations, his interests. I can say that with the way Congress is right now, none of that is going to happen. Um, but those, those are just some things that he's interested in. And I think there is interest, uh, maybe not in, in free, but I think there's interest in the higher education community about a state-federal partnership for, for college affordability. Um, and we're going to put out a report uh, of the viewpoints of the SHEOs on a state-federal partnership, their views on free community college, free four-year college uh, later this month. So. But I think that concept of the states and the feds uh, rowing in the same direction, uh, incentive, uh, incentives for states to invest in higher education, I think there is so certainly some support uh, in the higher education community uh, for that. But um, so that's where uh, Senator Sanders is on uh, uh, for, for his um, uh, portfolio. Ranking member Bill Cassidy has, has taken a more market oriented approach. Uh, that costs, of course, significantly uh, less than uh, Senator Sanders. And I think there is some, again, bipartisan support for some of the things that he's laid out here. And one uh, I'll draw your attention to is a federal unit record data system called, C uh, it's called the College Transparency Act. And so we have three of the four corners. So we have uh, Senate Democrats, Senate Republicans, and House Democrats all supporting uh, creating a federal unit records data system for higher education. The holdout is uh, the chair of the House Education Committee, Virginia Fox, uh, who actually wrote the ban on it in 2008. So as long as she's in that chair, that's not likely to move forward. But that is something that, that SHEO supports um, because it will provide more information to consumers, more information to, to states, to uh, institutions about the performance uh, of their students. Uh, uniform financial aid letters, better information on student loans. So there's a package of, of bills that uh, he has combined together for his lowering college cost and student debt act. But as far as a, a comprehensive authorization of the Higher Education Act, uh, I don't see it this Congress, but uh, here's hoping. We'll probably see if, if there's anything is that they pick off areas where there is some bipartisan support uh, and pass those in a piecemeal fashion. So then we go over to the House side. There is uh, Chairwoman uh, Virginia Fox. Uh, she's a Republican of, of North Carolina. Um, uh, I met with her earlier this year. Uh, I knew that there, there's some things that you, you can't say to her. I know one of them is training. We don't, she doesn't like the word training. She said, we train animals, we don't train people. Uh, but I, I fell into another one. I said, four-year degrees, four-year institutions. That was bad, that was a mistake. Uh, she's like, you can't call them four-year degrees unless you start graduating people in four years. So, um, 
So she, uh, but she's, she's outlined her portfolio and her interest. Um, uh, one of them right now is title recording requirements on foreign gifts and contracts. So this, uh, right now under the Higher Education Act, it's called Section 117. That would say, that says right now, if you have foreign gifts and contracts above $250,000, you have to report them to the federal government. Uh, that would be lowered down to $50,000. Um, and then there would also be, you know, just some more reporting requirements, stricter reporting requirements on what they would call countries of concern. So she's worried about foreign influences on American college and university campuses. Expanding Pell Grants to short-term programs. So is this something that you've heard about, short-term Pell, workforce Pell? Yeah? yeah. Brandy's here. <laughs> you all supportive of short-term Pell? So she was, is on board with short-term Pell. Uh, she, she's on board, of course, she's a leading a champion of short-term Pell. So what short-term Pell would do is basically fe federal Pell Grants are um, 15 weeks and above, and this would drop that down to shorter programs about eight weeks. So, and there is broad support for this, but when it gets down into the details of this, that's where we start to lose people. So one of the, the details is, for instance, and the big sticking one is whether for-profit colleges can participate in this. That's been a huge concern, um, be just because of the, the history of predatory behavior of for-profit colleges uh, in the student loan space, or in the, in the um, student aid space, just concerned that these institutions would uh, just private equity money would pour in and they'd unleash all of these programs that wouldn't deliver enough value to students. She, uh, Virginia Fox, is supportive of the for-profit colleges. She's included some guardrails, but I know on the Senate Democrat side that that's, that's just a non-starter uh, for them. Also, uh, online programs, whether whether online programs should be allowed to participate in short-term Pell. There was an amendment uh, last year that, uh, that they got onto, I think it was the Chips and Science Act, but it ultimately didn't get included in the final version, but it did include a short-term Pell program, but uh, online programs and for-profit uh, programs were, were taken out. And she's been very adamant that for-profit colleges should be allowed to participate in the uh, short-term Pell program. Uh, risk sharing for student loans. So this would basically, there's been a whole bunch of, of papers written on risk sharing for student loans and introducing some market dynamics into the, the um, student loan marketplace that if you give a student a student loan and the student doesn't repay the loan, then you're on the hook for a portion of those unpaid loans. There's been some bipartisan, there's certainly interest on the Republican side who see this as a way to hold institutions accountable. There's been actually some interest on the Democratic side because they see it as a way to, uh, to really focus on the for-profit colleges, which have a track record of, of students not repaying their debt on uh, for-profit colleges. But it's another issue where, where there may be interest in kind of the broad, the broad concept when you get down to the details of it, that's where it gets to be pretty complicated, um, particularly about um, uh, unintended consequences for students. Uh, if you, you know, take on a lot of low-income students, uh, students from underrepresented communities, and if you're taking on these students and you're graduating these students, the incentives might not be there to, to, to take a chance on some of these students. So, um, but that's, that's another um, issue that there's been a lot of, of talk about in the last few years. Ensuring campus speech on, uh, free speech on campus, I know uh, House Republicans have been focused on that and then also accreditation reform. Uh, one of the challenges is, this is, they've been talking about a, a piecemeal approach to, to the reauthorization as I mentioned earlier, uh, but the GOP lawmakers have been uh, increasingly frustrated by the uh, Biden administration's aggressive changes to federal higher education policy via the a regulatory process. So the Biden administration has been very, very active in using their powers under regulation uh, in order to change federal higher education policy. And I'll get that into, into that in a few minutes. Uh, any questions on federal higher education policy? 
David. Hi, Tom. Uh, David Pierce, Missouri. Um, I've heard the, the phrase omnibus mm -hmm. before. I think we all know that. What is a minibus? And what is the definition yeah, of I think that would be just a, a few. It's just a few of the bills then. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So omnibus would be all of them together. But I think when they talk about minibus, I think it would be just a few yeah, of the, the we, bills. We've had our senator talking about a minibus. Right. And getting a few, few of the bills passed. Yeah. Yep, and there have been there have been uh, some of the bills have have passed the the various chambers, but as far as getting all twelve of them or getting a negotiation, we're just not there yet. Yep. Yeah, Jack. Uh, Jack Hershey, Ohio. Um, I was wondering if you could talk on the previous uh, page was on the uniform financial aid letters. Yep. Um, I asked for this. Uh, reason so we have seen legislation at the state level mm -hmm. on this kind of out of the GAO report our yep. legislators saw it and decided they didn't want to wait for the federal government to take action on it we obviously have concerns and that they took that and then added some other things to it and mm -hmm. if what we're trying to figure out is is this is this something that the federal government will actually do because if it is we'd rather just wait and go along with the process that's going to be uniform across all 50 states. Mm -hmm. If not, I think we're worried that we're going to get 50 different versions of this at the state level, which could be confusing. I don't know if you have any insight on that particular one. Yeah, I know that there's been, um, I think this is the, it's maybe the Chuck Grassley bill. Um, I have to double check on that. but. Uh, there is a lot of, of interest in, in, financial, in uniform financial aid letters just because of so many institutions doing different things on financial aid and some of them frankly being deceptive as far as uh, a grant versus a loan and students not really knowing uh, what they're getting into. So there's been interest uh, in that, that uniform financial aid letter. I know that there are some complexities involved just because of the vast different types of, of institutions that are out there and what they offer. Um, and so I know from the... ACRO, I think, was the, the association, uh, but that represents admissions officers and registrars. Just the, that, broadly speaking, there's, there's interest in that, but there's a lot of complexity just because of the different types of institutions. Is this going to pass? Uh, not, not in the near future, but I would continue to, to inform your delegation about, about this and um, I can get back to you as far as, you know, where things are at on that bill. Yeah. So, Jack, um, and, and you may be aware that a number of uh, leaders in the D.C. higher community came together to, from a, a voluntary standpoint yep. to try to prevent this. And uh, uh, maybe two months ago, yep. we put together a group. Uh, the website's collegeprice.org, and uh, it has a list of uh, institutions and systems throughout the country that uh, have agreed to a broad common set of principles for financial aid letters and there is you know many hundreds yep. of institutions so I don't know to what degree that will appease federal lawmakers but it, hopefully it'll go some distance yep and uh, former APLU chair uh, president uh, Peter McPherson has been leading that effort I know Shio with Rob Anderson has been been active in that effort as well Good. Thank you, Dr. Hurley, for our records. Okay. Other questions? No oh, questions? Proceed. Okay. Okay, so FAFSA simplification. Uh, I'm going to get more into this tomorrow, but where are we at on FAFSA simplification? In talking with the folks at FSA, we're looking at a launch of mid to late December, which is basically the holidays and it's going to be they have to have it done by January 1 and we've tried to push them to get more toward early December as opposed to later in December just because we know that some states have early um, state financial aid deadlines uh, and we just want to make sure that um, students get those financial aid forms in but we are looking at a launch date of, of uh, mid or late December and uh, I don't know, if, have your states been adjusting your financial aid deadlines uh, in response to this? Or at all? I know like Texas has one that's very early in, in the year, but okay. 
Well, usually it's launches in October one, uh, and this is going to push it back and likely uh, into to mid to late uh, December. Uh, we do have some outstanding issues, and I will get into this uh, next or uh, in, into this tomorrow. But the issue of family farms and small businesses. Have any of you had a conversation in your state about the changes to family farms and small businesses in the FAFSA? Yeah. Well, uh, I can just bring you up to speed on that. The um, the old FAFSA would. Uh, say, hey, if you have a family farm or small business with less than 100 employees, you don't need to report your assets for the purposes of the, the FAFSA form. How that changes with this new FAFSA is that it's going to look at the net assets of family farms and small businesses. This is something that SHEO is certainly concerned about. Uh, we've seen a, a drop in rural students going on to higher education. And particularly when you think about it, just the, the non-liquid assets, if you take a family farm or a small business, the non-liquid assets, can you sell a piece of your farm to send your kid to college? Can you, send, can you sell the barn, or you can sell the tractor, sell the land? Um, it's, it doesn't quite work like that. And so SHEO has been working with uh, Senator Jerry Moran's office of Kansas, uh, Senator Chuck Grassley of Iowa, uh, John Tester of, of, of Montana, to try to at least go back to the, the system that we had prior. Um, but I know that, at least on the Senate Democratic side, that they are not moving on this issue. So we are, we're going to continue to push on this, but we're just concerned about the effects that this could have for, for students who are from a small business background or from a, a, a farming background, and that this could impede their access to federal student financial aid. It's not to say that the, the, the past system was perfect, um, but I think there's a middle ground there that we can find in order to, to support these students, okay? Uh, professional judgment for the number of, of children in college. Uh, how that's going to be used is, is another issue that we're, we're working through right now. Um, right now, you know, with the current FAFSA, if you have multiple kids in college, uh, it doesn't count for that. The new one will not. That's, of course, been a concern of our community um, and, and how financial aid officers and states can use, uh, state financial aid agencies can use that information, and use their professional judgments uh, on, on that. Uh, federal tax information, we've heard a lot about that. Um, the new FAFSA is going to be using data directly from the IRS, the IRS data retrieval tool. Uh, it was called the Future Act that passed a few years ago. So that will really ease, if you're use, using, it, using it online, you, you can get that tax information and, and really upload it right away to your, um, to your FAFSA form and really streamline that process. But with that, uh, there has been concerns about, I think it's from the IRS, about, about giving state agencies access to that uh, federal tax information. So I'm still trying to get more information on that, uh, but I know that a number of states use that information to provide uh, information to their legislatures about the breakdown as far as like income brackets and use of state financial aid. So we are, are, are looking into that, and, and we'll try to provide information as soon as we have that to you. Yeah. Senator Molly Baumgardner, um, the question in our state that we're dealing with is we have a lot of parents that are yeah. filling out FAFSA for themselves, going in for training. So how does that fit in with that professional judgment with the number of children if the parent is, in fact, um, applying to get FAFSA assistance to earn uh, RN degree or something like that? Yeah, I, I'm not sure that that will be affected by that. Um, but with the, the professional judgment, it's like if you, right now it's, you, the FAFSA takes into account, if you have two kids that are in college at the same time, you know, that can prevent, provide, of course, a financial hardship for, for people. <laughs> but if you have kids that are like five years apart from each other, um, you don't get that same benefit. And so some would say that that's sort of unfair, you know. Um, but for, at least for the interim period, the concern is about 
how do we how do we transition to this this new system? But I'm not sure as far as like parents filling it out for themselves um, and, and their own college aspirations. I'm not sure that that would be applicable right now. But I can definitely get back to you on that. But specifically, the parent filling it out for yeah. themselves as well as for their child. Oh, for their child, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. As far as for their children, yeah. To I would, uh, I'd have to check as far as yeah, multiple students at college and the professional judgment. That's something that's kind of an ongoing discussion. Yep. Um, Prof. Kothari, Illinois. Um, what? Can you talk a little bit? And it sounds like you're going to do more FAFSA stuff tomorrow, so feel free to defer if that's appropriate. Mm -hmm. Um, can you talk a little bit about what the difference in the output of the sort of so student submits FAFSA, student family submits, so how will the output or what will they get back that will, how will that be different for this family to interpret or for scholarship providers to interpret? What is the, what is the result of submitting your FAFSA going to look like going forward? Um, yeah, that's something I, I still have to, to, to dig into more. Um, but uh, I think the, the federal tax information um, is one that we're, we're working on, works on right now, at least from the state agency perspective. But um, as far as the, the information they get back, I'm, I'm still yeah, trying to work with, with FSA uh, on that. Yep. Okay. All right. So just transitioning next to student loan repayment, uh, big policy changes here very generous student loan repayment uh, uh, program from the Biden administration called the Saving on a Valuable Education Program, the SAVE program. So uh, what this would do is borrowers would pay 5% of their income above 225% of the federal poverty level instead of 10% of their income above 150% of the poverty level. So this is actually a very big policy change. And the, the administration has uh, the right to to make these student loan repayment programs, but if you're a single borrower making less than 328, or a family of four making less than 67,000 uh, annually, you will have zero payments. Uh, there's also um, payments will not go from unpaid interest, but also the uh, principal balances that were $12,000 or less will receive forgiveness after 10 years of payments, um, and then for at least for uh, for each additional 1,000 borrow above that, the plan adds an additional 12 payments for a max of 10, 20 to 25 years. So this is a big, uh, big policy change. It's a by far the most generous student loan repayment program uh, out there. This has also uh, raised some eyebrows on Capitol Hill. Uh, there's a lot of concerns with Republicans about how we pay for this, just because there's been estimates that it costs. Uh, upwards of $550 billion over, over 10 years. Okay. But right now they have about 5.5 billion or million borrowers have signed up for this uh, more generous student loan repayment plan thus far. So the regional tech hubs, I'd be interested to see from you all and just your, your response on this. This is something that Shio uh, a push for? Oh, yep. uh, just real quick on the previous. Yep. Uh, Identify yourself, please. Mike, Mike Carney, South Dakota. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, does does the what if the five percent of their repayment back doesn't cover the interest now? Is that part of? Um, yeah, if it's if there's unpaid interest at the end when you make your payment and there's unpaid interest, that unpaid interest will not accumulate. Yep. Yep. Can I the question? Oh, sorry. Um, I just just uh, when we talk about the cost, mm -hmm. I'm wondering if did you identify yourself? I'm sorry, Carol Glanville. Okay, Michigan. thank you. Yep. Um, so, can you define cost? Because what I'm thinking is, you know. Like the money might not be going back to obviously the loan repayment, but it's going into the economy. Right. So what is the actual? Do we have an idea? Like well, how are they defining costs? Yeah, I think it's just the cost to the federal government, um, and this that's from the Wharton uh, School at Penn. They've done some estimates on this, um, and also there's I think CBO did an estimate on this as well. But uh, yeah, that was just the main concern is, is when they do all the cost estimates on this, 
over 10 years and all the people signing up for this, what is this going to cost as far as adding to the national debt? Yep. I mean, not an economist. I know we have one in the room. Yep. <laughs> is, it, does that make sense? Is, is that a sensible art mm -hmm. question to ask? Like, how does this, like, the money might not be going right. to the government, but it's going into the economy. Can we look at how that balances? Right. Can we think yep. about how many people are not buying homes and not doing, you know, other financial absolutely things, keeping the mechanisms running, buying cars, you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, there's been a lot of concern about the the growing student debt loads and what this means for a whole host of of things. Um, we talked about birth rates uh, down 23 percent nationally since 2007. Uh, people not being able to buy houses. Um, and also, businesses are looking this, at this as well. Uh, my brother works for, for a large business, and he's actually, they actually factor in the changes in the student loan repayment uh, as far as buying their product goes. So uh, $1.75 trillion in student debt uh, is, is nothing to scoff at anymore. And as far as its effect on consumers being able to, to buy goods. Uh, and we've seen this, of course, the statistics during the pandemic when we had the, the student loan repayment pause, um, and now how that, how we're out of that now. But um, yeah, it, it certainly does have an effect on, on the economy. Um, uh, and then, of course, the, the other side would say, well, but it also has an effect on the national debt, too. And we have to consider that. So there's a variety of different viewpoints on that. Yep. Yep. Did you have a question, Marcy? I was just hoping people would um, talk into the microphone okay. um, so that yeah. we can all hear, especially if they're not talking at us. Okay, thank you. I'll try to do that as well. Tom, uh, David Pierce, Missouri. I know a, a few years ago there was uh, the problem of the public service loan repayment program right. being funded. Um, and I know, uh, especially those going into education and yep. things like that, that's such a tremendous program. Where, where do you see that funding uh, currently and in the future? Yeah, I don't see that changing at all. Um, now, the administration of that program, I think the administration is trying to clean up because there were so many people who were applying for that PSLF. Um, and uh, I think this was during the last administration, but they said it was like upwards of 90% of people who weren't getting the, the forgiveness on that because of various clerical errors or um, uh, uh, not filling out paperwork or things like that. So this administration has been focused on how do we clean up that program and make sure that students have access uh, to that, that public service loan forgiveness program. So if any of you aren't familiar with the PSLF, that is a program that was put in place in 2007. And that uh, if you make in, uh, income-based repayment for 10 years and you are in public service, and that's a very broad definition of public service, so that's basically public sector and not-for-profit sector. You make 10 years of income-based repayment, and after 10 years, your debt is wiped out. For a lot of, of course, for people who are in lower paying but vital positions, teaching, social work, um, some folks in healthcare, uh, at, at uh, non-profit, uh, um, uh, entities, this is a, a real lifeline for them. And uh, we've seen, of course, a lot of uh, concerns about the not enough teachers out there, not enough people in some of these lower paying but vital roles. So uh, I don't see that um, changing. There may be on the higher end, you know, not right now, but looking forward, if we have an, another, uh, a change in administration, I can see going forward potential caps on that um, just because of the cost of the program. And I think the Obama years, they were talking about like $57,000 in forgiveness or something like that. Um, that was, again, maybe 10 years ago. But there is a concern on PSLF just similar to the SAVE plan about the cost of it uh, to, to taxpayers. Yep. yep. Katie Stewart from Illinois. Um, I'm just wondering if there's anything on the federal level looking at regulation of income share agreements. As mm -hmm. the, if anybody that doesn't yep. know, that's where they are. They say they are investing in the student, and then the repayment is based on their later earnings um, in life. And yep. I get a lot of approach about 
how to regulate them at the state level, and I'm just interested if there's anything in the federal right. level that would be changing. Yeah, there have been efforts at the federal level to uh, provide some guardrails on, on income share agreements. I, I think there's been mostly interest from uh, Republicans, because they see this as a, uh, as a real tool for people to, uh, a market-based tool for people to, for private entities to, to invest in students, and then students pay back a, a portion of their, their income. Uh, but, of course, there is concern about abuse of students and predatory behavior, and we've seen states uh, like, like yours regulate on that. As far as federal government goes, I, the chatter on that hasn't been as much lately, but uh, there is certainly interest from Republicans about, uh, about promoting this as a, as a financing tool and then providing some federal guardrails as far as uh, regulations are concerned. Dr. Harnish, I have two questions. All right, you talked about the Pell Grant being at, uh, I, I hope I have it right, 7,395, right? mm -hmm. is that what you said? Yep. Okay, now, over a 20 year period of time, if we go back 20 years, has the Pell Grant increased or decreased? Mm -hmm. The Pell Grant has increased. Um, now, I, I, I wanna preface that. Has it increased in, um, you have to adjust it for, if you adjust it for inflation, um, it has, has increased. Um, but if you adjust it for like other factors like college costs and the rising college costs, um, not nearly, it, it hasn't kept up, the purchasing power hasn't kept up with the rise in college costs. I asked that question, I'm at the University of Kansas and we yep. talk about it. I went to college, but I did not have a Pell Grant. I have right. most of the scholarships, but when I'm looking at increased, so it has gone up. It has gone up, but uh, whether it's, it depends on, again, your inflation, um, and it can be one, if you just looked at regular CPI, regular inflation, um, it's, uh, it's gone up. But if you like, compare it to things that are going up much faster over the last 20 years, like college costs, the rising cost of tuition, the purchasing power of Pell has gone down uh, dramatically. Yeah. So it depends on, on what angle you're, you're looking at it. With. All right, my this question, it came up in a lengthy discussion about debt. Previously, you were not allowed or did not have the ability, I guess, to use credit cards for tuition or anything else. Mm -hmm. I mean, generally, you just had your money, you wrote your checks, or you were on a time plan or whatever. The question a student asked me was, has debt, is there any correlation between that and being able to charge with credit cards and how do you know that what's being charged is really for higher ed or is it other things? Yeah, great question. Um, uh, I, I don't know, you know if, how to, to decipher between those two because so much of college costs right now are in those non-tuition expenses. And Pell can be used for both your, like if we look at Pell grants or other student loans or the like, that can be used for, of course, your tuition but also those non-tuition costs. And if I'm at a community college, the bulk of my cost to go to that community college are in those non-tuition expenses. So um, as far as someone having credit card debt um, and being able to, to decipher between those two, I kind of lump them all together toward, toward college costs. But uh, it, it's a good question. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll, when I go back, I'll tell them you said it was a good question. Yeah, it is a good question, yeah. But we're, we're, rarely, we're really concerned. Um, the last few years, we've seen the, the college costs moderate as far as like tuition costs go. Um, and some of that has been, much of that has been the rising commitment from states that has uh, kept tuition in check. Uh, a lot of it has been the federal government has been giving money to states. And that's, that's helped uh, keep tuition in check. But those non-tuition costs are really concerning. Uh, that's the, the, co the rising cost of, of housing, for example particularly uh, on the coast, but also you know, uh, here in the Midwest too, it, are those, uh, those non-tuition expenses. All right, thank you very much. Other further questions? Seeing none.
Thank okay. you. Well, we will uh, continue on to regional technology hubs. So this is something that uh, I know when I was at a previous MEC meeting they, they brought up. And uh, the, the focus and interest behind this, these regional technology hubs, has been that so much of our private investment in this country is funneled into just a few select areas. Silicon Valley, Boston, the Dulles Corridor outside of DC. And what we'd like to see is trying to develop other parts of the, and that has, that has consequences as far as like the, the enormous cost of living uh, in those areas, uh, environmental costs, um, that, uh, that's real as far as so much of our, of our focus and our energy and our funding going into just a few areas of this country. So the question is how do we develop technology hubs outside of those areas? And the Biden administration uh, has said, you know, we're going to invest in this, we're gonna create these regional technology hubs program and states and regions are going to apply. And they're gonna focus on areas of workforce, economic growth, innovation, commercialization, if I just go to my next slide here, these are some of the hubs that we're looking at. I know uh, I used to live in Madison and they're building out a, a biotech hub, I believe, uh, there. So uh, it's really on the, the cutting edge of innovation and it's included, again, across a whole wide array of, of states. And it's, yep. Who, who are the enter entities that are generally participating as the, the hubs? Is it Universities, or is it private businesses? It, it's it's a, a consortium. So universities, private businesses, nonprofits, governments are all coming together on on these these applications. And so that was kind of the connection with with our community is just that uh, universities had to be at the table for this. So, yeah. so maybe I'll give the Minnesota example. So we've gotten a med tech hub, which yep. includes University of Minnesota, Minnesota State, uh, Mayo. Medtronic, Boston Scientific, um, United Health Group. So there's a, a mm -hmm. broad variety. The Greater MSP is yep. the kind of coordinating group. Um, we're very excited about it, of course. And uh, there's a lot because there's so much med tech mm -hmm. here in the state that made sense for us to uh, to try to invest in that area. Yep. So yeah, it's a consortium of of different groups and uh, coming together on these these applications. And there's federal funding behind it, but also uh, branding, technical assistance, foreign direct investment, intellectual property guidance. So there's really um, a lot of benefits uh, to this, this program. Okay. Question? Tom. Yeah. Um, this is Susan Hegard. I'm just wondering, on the tech hubs, will there be another round of funding, or is this it? Um, it, it's ultimately going to depend on Congress, but this, uh, there's, yeah, there would be further funding, it looks like, down the road. Yep. Okay. Okay. Question, yeah. Larry. Larry Tiedemann from South Dakota. If you could go back to that other slide, and I can't read mm -hmm. the color co coordination with what it is. Right. Um, I can't even read it from here, but uh, I will, uh, I'll provide the slides afterwards so you, you have, uh, and I can provide the information on South Dakota's as well. Yep. Okay. Continuing on to the overtime rule. Have any of you had conversations about the overtime rule? Oh, yeah. Okay. So there was a big letter that went out from the higher education community on the overtime rule. So uh, this is something that's been, if you look at the various administrations, there's been uh, different approaches to this. So this is the Fair Labor Standards Act overtime pay requirements. So to be exempt from overtime pay, employees must meet three criteria. They must be salaried. They must make at least 35000 568, and their primary duties must be executive, administrative, or professional. So if you meet those three criteria, you are exempt from overtime pay. Going back 
uh, some years ago with the Obama administration. They wanted, it was at 23,000 going back to 2004 with the Bush administration. The Obama administration basically wanted to double it to 47,000. Uh, that was taken to court. The court ruled against uh, the, the Obama administration. The Trump administration got into office and, and did increase it, not nearly as much, but they increased it to about 35,000. Uh, 568 where it is right now. So that started on July 1 or January 1 of 2020. The Biden administration has come in and they would like to increase that threshold to 55,000, uh, around $55,000. Okay. So this, uh, like the slide says, would extend eligibility to 3.6 million workers nationwide. In higher education, because faculty and um, non-faculty focused on teaching are not covered under this rule due to what's known as the teacher exemption. Uh, it looks like student workers aren't covered either. Other professionals on campus though would be. So that would be uh, admissions, registrars, uh, student affairs, IT, I know athletics as well. So there are a number of parts of, of college administration that would be uh, affected by that. And so uh, university associations have put out a letter uh, this week, just arguing that this is going to lead to tuition increase and, and layoffs. But I'd welcome uh, your thoughts or any questions you have on that overtime rule. And they have received about 33,000 comments on this, so they have to go through all of those comments before they uh, publish a final rule. Okay. okay. So just something to watch out for there. Uh, and then we'll finish up with regulations. There's been a lot of regulating, a lot of regulating. Um, and we just finished a round of new regulations uh, focused on those five areas right there. I'm going to go briefly through them. <coughs> I still haven't had time to go through all. I think it's 695 pages of regulations on this. <laughs> So uh, please excuse me on, on some of these. But those, those are the regulations that uh, went out. It's on the, what's known as the master calendar. So what the master calendar basically says is if you are going to publish regulations, you have to have them in by November 1 in order for them to take effect July 1 of next year. So they got them all in by November 1 and on, on those five issues listed. We do have an ongoing negotiated rulemaking on student loan forgiveness. Now you'll remember that this summer where we had the Supreme Court ruling on student loan forgiveness and they struck it down. Uh, that was using the HEROES Act of 2003. The Biden administration has said, okay, we're going to try to get to student loan forgiveness through the Higher Education Act, which gives the secretary some ability to, to waive um, student loans. Now, how much authority does the secretary have? That's probably going to be contested, but they're going through that right now. They're not going to, in this negotiated rulemaking, it's not like they did before where it'd be like a broad-based student loan forgiveness that they got taken to court for. Um, it would be focused on, on certain hardships and, and um, specific issues like that, but um, the administration is, is pursuing right now uh, a rulemaking on student loan forgiveness. They have done two, two rounds of the negotiated rulemaking and they'll finish the third round um, in, in December. In early 2024, they're going to have yet another round of negotiated rulemaking focused on institutional quality and accountability. So we'll watch for that. That affects a lot of issues that, of course, SHEO cares about. And then on a separate track, these are all um, related to Title IV of the Higher Education Act, which has a negotiated rulemaking uh, provision where you have to go through this, this process. There's also another regulation that's out there that a lot of people are waiting for. Um, that's non-Title IV, and that's Title IX. So that has to do with um, sexual harassment on campus as well as uh, transgendered athletes and their participation in sports. Uh, and the administration has put out draft 
uh, regulations on that. They've received hundreds of thousands of comments. Uh, there's a lot of interest in that uh, uh, in those regulations. And that uh, was supposed to come out in May. Then they said, okay, we'll get this out in October. October has passed. And they said, we're just not finished with it yet. We still have to go through all of the, the comments. So again, this is an issue where it's there's a lot of passion on both sides uh, about how this how these issues are adjudicated. So uh, the administration has to go through and, and respond to, to all of these, these comments. So it's something we are, are watching out for. So, oh, go ahead. So um, within the gainful employment regulation, which mostly applies to for-profit. For-profits, yep. Uh, there's a, an additional regulation around value reporting. Yep. Applies to all institutions, um, which is really about the ROI on post-baccalaureate degrees. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're starting to think about how we might comply with that. My understanding is we're going to provide names and social security numbers, and they're going to pull data from IRS okay. and figure out how much students earned three years after their degree, that kind of thing. Okay. We're especially concerned about uh, degrees in teaching and nursing and social yep. work, yep. where uh, salaries are low, sure. and those all showing up as bad degrees, sure. at which point, uh, and my understanding is any student who wants to enroll in that degree needs to sign a release form that like says, a warning, and right. I'm not going to earn my money back. Right. Um, so is there any advocacy around that part of that gainful employment um, regulation? Thank you, Rachel. Yep. Um, a good question. Uh, I don't think that, I haven't been involved in that, I should say, yet. Um, I I think we're, we're, we're going through a few other issues right now, but I think that is something, again, to, to talk with your, um, with your associations about, because I think there's a lot of concern about students getting those forms and saying, hey, you know, what, am I, what exactly am I getting into? Um, but there's also, of course, the, the other side where they're looking at transparency and um, ensuring that, that students aren't getting in over their head with some of these, these programs. So I think there's certainly a balance to be, be struck there. And that's right here. I think that you're referring to the FTBT? Yep. Okay. Yep. And there is, you know, there are um, tools out there uh, to, to provide students with information about um, post-employment earnings. One tool that I don't know if, if any of you have have uh, researched or, or used at all um, that we've been promoting a lot at SHEO is called the PSEO. Have any of you been focused? Okay, PSEO. So the post-secondary uh, employment outcomes. And what that does is that it matches uh, UI rage records to uh, university transcript records. And it's from the Census Bureau and it's an opt-in state by state. And you can see a really neat tool, not just where they uh, go in their state, but if they go outside the state as well. And that has a number of benefits, I think, as opposed to, to some of the other tools that are out there. Um, now, again, it's, it's a little incomplete as far as who's, who's participating in that. It is an experimental project at Census right now, but we are trying to, to promote that and get the word out about PSEO and just encourage states to look at that and potentially participate in that. Proceed. Okay. So uh, gainful employment, as was uh, brought up earlier, this has, um, these are kind of the two, this is a lot of text, I know, um, but they have a, a debt to earnings rate um, that compares uh, median uh, annual payments on student loan debt to the median earnings of, federal, uh, uh, of federally aided graduates. Basically, the, the, the thrust behind the gainful employment rule is that you can't load up students with a ton of debt that's not in any way commensurate to what they earn in the marketplace. And because the way the law is, it applies to career programs, uh, mostly geared at, at for-profit colleges, but also uh, some community college programs uh, as well. And for students that are fall outside of those career programs, um, as was mentioned earlier, there are uh, warnings to current and prospective students that the program could be at risk of eligibility um, if they fail these programs. 
but also the tr financial transparency um, uh, that will provide information to all students in all programs on the typical earnings, outcomes, borrowing amounts, cost of attendance, and sources of financial aid to help students make more informed choices. So this is a very controversial provision um, that the for-profit college industry has fought for years, um, and it's going to go into effect uh, starting July 1, uh, and the metrics are going to be published in 2025, and the first year that programs uh, may become eligible is 2026. I can tell you, though, if there is a shift in administration, this will be one of the first things that does get targeted. Yep. Okay. So I'm just going to do a quick tour of this. I'm happy to talk. I know I only have a few minutes. I'm happy to talk offline or, or send you information about these, these regulations. Uh, but there's new regulations on financial responsibility. So this concerns uh, institutional closures. Institutional closures, of course, are disruptive to students. And this protects them from potential losses. So um, making sure that we have financially sound institutions of, of higher education and they have trigger events that require letters of credit or forms of financial protection. So, and those mandatory triggers are listed right there. And then there's also some discretionary triggers that can uh, require, uh, uh, result in a requirement to provide financial protection uh, on a case-by-case -case determination, and those are listed right there. So that's, again, pertains to the financial stability of institutions of higher education. And we've put out research on, from SHEO just talking about uh, the devastating effect of, of campus closures that can have on, on students. Uh, administrative capability. So this uh, pertains, institutions need to de demonstrate that they are uh, administering Title IV programs. So this just talks about um, services that they have to provide to students, so financial aid and, and career services and the like. Certification procedures, and the big one here, uh, of course, there's distance education, and I know that MEC and um, WICHE and other groups like that have been really focused on that distance education requirement, uh, as well as those re related to state licensure programs. So uh, I'd encourage you, if you're interested in, um, in those distance education uh, provisions, there's a, a great blog out there from WCET, uh, Russ Poland, uh, and Cheryl Dowd and the team there go through that and what that means for, for institutions. Uh, but that, again, pertains to, to <clears throat> distance education uh, programs. And there was concern about in, in, in within the higher education community about, about these regulations and what this would mean for, um, it, there's been a push that when you provide these distance education programs, uh, about complying with individual state laws versus a reciprocity agreement. And if you have to apply, if you have to abide by all these individual state laws, um, would that ruin potentially the reciprocity agreement? And would that lead to increased uh, administrative costs for, for colleges and universities? So that is something that we are, uh, we're tracking. And then uh, the ability to benefit, uh, uh, this is for uh, students without a high school diploma pursuing a financial aid. So happy to talk offline uh, with you about any of those. And then uh, this is the, the ongoing negotiated rulemaking on student loans. So those are the issues that they are uh, exploring in, in that negotiated rulemaking. And then the next negotiated rulemaking in 2024 uh, pertains to, to the issues listed there. But uh, I think the big one that we're focused on is, is distance education and also uh, accreditation. So with that, uh, I know Dan mentioned my state policy update, or my federal and state policy update. Uh, the sign up link is there. Um, but with that, um, I think we have a few minutes, yeah. Tom, um, this is Susan Hegard. I have a, just a, three comments. Um, one, first, um, that Mary has already posted your presentation on our website. So for folks who want to poke around and spend some time with that, it's already um, up. Correct, Mary? Um, second, Blake online posted a, 
um, comment. Tom, thank you for all your work to assist rural students. Oh, yeah. I just wanted to make yeah. sure you... And we're going to we're gonna continue to, to work on that and try to get that uh, family farm provision changed. Yep. And then um, I wanted to just mention that um, PSEO, we all love our acronyms, but um, if you were at our uh, executive committee meeting in Madison, Wisconsin, Jason Pontius, who's with the Iowa Board of Regents, um, actually when Rob and I were visiting there, um, we, you know, when we visit your states, we show data on student migration, the in and the out. And when we were talking at the Board of Re with the Board of Regents, um, the director there said, hey, you know, you should meet Jason on our staff. So we, Jason came in and sat and talked to us. And then we invited him to present at our June meeting. So his presentation is posted, I think there's 25 states, maybe. Yeah, and there's more, more joining every more year. Now. But um, the thing that's really cool about the migration data is um, this opportunity to be able to actually see we, we, we're able to show with our data, which is pretty minimal, somebody leaves and comes back. We can sort of look a year or two out, but this data actually can look out further than that yeah. and track earnings. And whether students like me, right, you know, I, went, I, went to, I grew up here, I went to school in New York, I came home. Then I moved to Texas and I came home. Then I went to D.C. and I came home. And so it would be able to follow, you know, students and figure out, all right, who comes back and who doesn't. And it's, it's really interesting and compelling. Yep, and you can see one, five, and ten years out, the earnings. You can see what uh, program they're in and also uh, what, where are they living. Yep. And I know uh, for a lot of states are concerned about brain drain. And, you know, I know in Wisconsin people were concerned about people moving to Chicago and, or to Minneapolis. And you can, that helps inform those discussions about potential brain drain. It, it does, and, and the question is, you know, should you fret if people don't come back after five years, or should you fret after they don't come back after, after 10? And so I think yeah. good data really helps, uh, especially policymakers, um, identify where they want to focus. Yeah, and I think also, too, it dispels some of the myths out there about the liberal arts, um, that people think that if you're not you know, in a STEM field that you're not going to be making any money right now, ever. And it turns out that, you know, People do go on and live, you know, middle class lives generally with, with these um, with these degree programs. So, okay, so we are at the top of the hour. Let so. me so thank you so very much, yep. and especially for going longer mm -hmm. and to take the place of Laura Tamaka. Uh, but I think it was worthwhile because we were able to get more into it, more mm -hmm. questions in the process, and you know, it's not. You know, there's some subjects that people are just really excited about and they want to hear more and more about it. I think higher education is one of those that we need to hear about it. They may not want to hear all the details, but we need to know all the new mm -hmm. yep. regulations that are coming down and how we can live within it because that mm -hmm. means changes. Right. And when you have changes like that, it is really difficult. And of course, we, you know, we discussed tuition and we did a mm -hmm. variety of things, but I think by just looking at them, uh, a, a more global picture of how it all works. Yeah. I think you did a really outstanding job, so thank you so much. Oh, well, thank you.